What is up guys, my name is Inspector McDuck and in this video we're going to do an in-depth analysis to try to figure out who Gemini is and was in Lies of P. Fair warning, it should be obvious, but massive spoilers ahead for this game, so if you haven't played it, go play it. Don't watch this video yet. It's worth playing to experience this on your own, but if you don't have time for that, then uh, I guess watching my video would be a, a cool second option. So let's get into it. So in this video, I'm going to attempt to answer three questions. First, who was Gemini prior to the events of the game, right? So when we meet him, he's this little cricket puppet. He's stuck in a lamp. But can we try to figure out what his his life was like before we met him when he was supposedly with the legendary stalker? Number two, what is Gemini's relationship with Sophia? When we start the game, she seems intimately familiar with him already. So how are they connected exactly? And number three, who is Gemini now and why does Sophia tell us that he's unique? What makes him special versus all of the other characters that we meet in the game? So I have to say off the bat, I have a theory that I hold at this moment of who Gemini was and is and his whole story. But before we dive into that, let's take a look at the moment in the game that if you've played the game, you probably sat up straight in your seat. You're like, hang on, what? Please teach me how to use a sword. You're a legendary stalker. Ugh, so annoying. Gemini, get rid of her. I'm off. What? So I don't know about you guys, but it seems pretty improbable that a cricket puppet stuck inside of a lamp would be able to dismiss some meddlesome boys, right? So the logical conclusion anyone would reach is that, oh, Gemini must have been human and he was traveling with the legendary stalker and eventually he died from petrification disease. Then his ergo was placed into this cricket puppet and he awakened inside the lamp and that's the Gemini we know, right? That's all the information we've got. Good, great, case closed. Thanks, see you later. Guys, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed this insight into Gemini. Like and subscribe. Ah! Got he! <laughs> okay, I know, that was dumb, I'm sorry. If I'm making this video, it, it wouldn't be that simple, right? It, it would kind of be naive to base an entire theory on this one scene we get from Gemini. So let's take a look at some events in the game as they happen chronologically and start building a solid baseline of what we actually know about Gemini. And then we'll go in, find some more clues and finally piece it all together and come up with this big hypothesis, right? And speaking of the hypothesis, I said I would tell you guys what I think up front. So I guess I should stay true to my word. My theory as it stands right now with the information that I currently have, and this may change based on updates and DLC or whatever, but my current theory is that Gemini was someone who accompanied the legendary stalker. But I don't think he was a human. I think he was a puppet all along, but it goes a little deeper than that. I don't think he was a traditional puppet. I think Gemini was designed specifically more as a consciousness, so to speak. He was a system of ergo that was capable of absorbing more ergo and learning and adapting. And basically the workshops attempt at creating a puppet that was as close to human as possible. And he had some very specific functions that I will get into in a minute. But anyway, Gemini exists as a consciousness who was once inside of a puppet, a puppet that could fight really well. We'll get into that. And then eventually that body was damaged and he was transferred into the cricket puppet inside the lamp. Now, if that sounds insane to you, McDuck, where are you getting all this information? Don't worry, we're gonna get into it. I'll explain it all, and hopefully you'll you'll feel me by the end of it. And if not, that's okay. It's just my theory. You can come up with your own. Okay, let's get into it. Section one. Let's talk about what we know about Gemini already. Before we start fleshing out this theory, we need to go through and establish a baseline of knowledge of everything that we actually actively witness in the game and we'll document all of that and and start our baseline so let's go from there and we'll go through the game chronologically if you've already played the game a lot of this is going to seem obvious and you're going to wonder why it's important but i promise you it is important because we'll come back later to revisit some of these things and they may make a little more sense once we flesh out some details so what do we know about gemini 
So when we start the game, we're awakened inside of a train by a blue butterfly that is sent to us by Sophia. And she's speaking to us telepathically. And almost immediately, we see a small lamp that once we inspect it, it speaks to us in this robotic voice and refers to itself as Gemini. Once we actually pick up the lamp, we learn that, interestingly, it's not called Gemini. Instead, it's referred to as Monad's lamp, with a description that says it is a lamp with a small cricket puppet inside. So right away with this information, we can pretty quickly assume that Gemini is the cricket puppet inside of the lamp and not the lamp itself. Before we exit the train car, we choose one of three combat styles that determine our starting stats. There's Path of the Cricket, Path of the Bastard, and Path of the Sweeper. Once we select a style, we exit the train and then we begin to fight our way through frenzied puppets to get to the hotel. Now during this time, Gemini speaks to us a handful of times, but his voice is distorted and his messages are robotic with, with no character or personality whatsoever. Then we reach the hotel and meet Sophia, and she comments on Gemini's condition and mentions that he may need to be fixed. Look at Gemini. I think he's in shock. Gemini is fine. That's proof you're broken. The real Gemini isn't so calm. So this interaction tells us that Sophia has enough of a history with Gemini to understand his personality and there's something about him that doesn't seem quite right. We can also get some optional dialogue from Sophia about Gemini and Monad's lamp where she says this. In the folklore of Krat, a cricket often acts as a guide. That is why these automated models became popular. But Gemini is unique. He's more than just a guide. So it's a little unclear if this means that the lamps were mass produced or just the crickets themselves. Uh, but either way, with this, we're supposed to understand that Gemini is, he's not like other crickets. I'm built different. So at this point, about 30 minutes into the game, we know that Gemini is a cricket puppet inside of a lamp. There's a real version of Gemini that Sophia knows, and there's something about Gemini that makes him unique. When we leave the hotel towards Elysian Boulevard, within a few seconds, Gemini is suddenly a, a new bug, <laughs> right? He's speaking to us out of nowhere as if uh, he's an actual person. Hey, let's be more careful. Ah, the Black Rabbit Brotherhood. I hate these guys. Now, this tells us two things. One, it tells us that Gemini is now fixed, or at least, you know, closer to being fixed than he was before. Two, this also tells us that Gemini has a pre-existing knowledge of not only of Krat, but the inhabitants of Krat, because he's able to recognize a member of the Black Rabbit Brotherhood right away. Then we speak to him at the Stargazer, and he mentions being a friend of Sophia's. He says something about seeing her the last time he woke up, and he admits some degree of memory loss. So all of this preps us to think that Gemini is a pretty important character, that he's, he's going to play a major role in the story. But then, through most of the game, it seems like he doesn't. The majority of our interactions with Gemini for a while after this aren't very revealing. We go an incredibly long time without learning anything new or notable about Gemini himself. We make it through the Cathedral, Path of the Pilgrim, the Malum District, Rosa Isabel Street, Estella Opera House, Lorenzini Arcade, the Grand Exhibition, the Barren Swamp, and Krat Central Station revisited. Now, an interesting thing to note is that at this point in the game, we've spoken to enough NPCs to notice that Sophia is the only person who talks to us about Gemini or references Gemini, and she actually speaks directly to him, but no one else says anything about him, which is weird because if he's supposedly unique and special, then it seems like someone would be like, hey man, that cricket you got is pretty cool. Like, where'd you get it? Can you get me one? You know, whatever, <laughs> but they don't. No one mentions it, which is, it, that's odd, right? I don't know, but we'll solve that one here in a little bit. Anyway, we adventure with Gemini through all these areas, and it's not until we unlock the secret passage from the hotel and travel down to the Relic of Trismegistus that we finally get the first real piece of dialogue from Gemini that you know, kind of makes us sit up straight. You know, it's the strangest feeling. I, I, I think I've been here before. Now, for the first time, Gemini's giving us a direct clue to his past life, his life prior to adventuring with us. 
Now, unfortunately, at this point, it's still difficult to deduce any real info about him. Saying he's been here before would make sense as a cricket guide inside of a lamp as anyone could have brought him down with them to explore. Regardless, we venture on, we defeat the Black Rabbit Brotherhood once and for all and take a submarine to the Isle of Alchemists. Then after meeting Sophia at the Black Seaside and learning, or more like confirming that she's been a projection all along, we start to witness memories appearing from the large influx of ergo floating to the island. And then we encounter the memory that unexpectedly name drops Gemini out of nowhere. Now, my biggest question at this point when I played the game, and I don't know about you guys, but I'm going, why isn't Gemini commenting on this? You know, he's so talkative and he has so much personality. How come he's not like, dude, that was me. Like she's talking about me. He doesn't say anything. Why not? Why is he silent? The only thing that I can think of is that these visions that you're seeing are direct ergo communications, I guess, or you're experiencing them through ergo, but maybe they're not actually physically present on the beach. So Gemini's unaware of them, like their direct transmission somehow. I don't know. Anyway, kind of mad at the game for that. We're like, what the heck, man? You can't just drop that bomb on us and leave us hanging. That's exactly what they did. And that's exactly why I'm making this video right now, because it made me question everything. So anyway, after this, there are two more notable exchanges with Gemini that give us some more information. The first of which is actually missable depending on a choice that you make. When we finally reach the real actual Sophia who's being drained of her power by Simon, we can choose to give her peace and absorb her ergo into ourselves and get a new hairstyle in the process, or we can choose to let her live instead. And if we choose this option, Gemini references his strong connection to her. Sophia, I can't seem to make contact, but I can still sense her which is really interesting in itself, but as soon as you leave the room and try to go up the tower, this happens. Sophia, I think she's gone, pal. I, I can't sense her anymore. So the main thing we can glean from this encounter is that Gemini is so closely connected to Sophia that he can sense her life force, which has some huge implications, and we'll dive into that later in the video. The last notable exchange with Gemini is when we're climbing the tower, and he can sense a massive amount of ergo saying that it feels like someone walked across his grave. Did you feel that? It's like someone walked across my grave. Now that's a curious thing to say because he could have easily phrased it as generically feeling the souls of the dead as ergo float around us, but by mentioning his own grave, we can wonder if this means that Gemini has actually died before. And that's it. We defeat Simon Manus, we defeat the Nameless Puppet, uh, unless you chose to give your heart to Geppetto, you monster. Shame on you. Uh, and we get an ending. That's it. Nothing else to learn about Gemini, right? Well, that's the end of the obvious information that we have about Gemini. Here's where we get to start looking back at some of the other information that the game gives us about the history of Krat, about Ergo, about puppets, and see if we can find some more clues to figure out exactly who he is. So for this part, we've got to do a lot of careful reading and we've got to pay attention to details and start pulling things that may be clues or hints as to who Gemini is or was. So one of the loading screens from the game states that the Grand Covenant forces puppets to serve humans. However, there are a few puppets in Krat that have broken free of the Grand Covenant and which act according to their own volition. Now, by saying a few puppets, this is worded in a sense that suggests that there were puppets prior to the puppet frenzy that would have needed to be controlled and or eliminated. This idea that there have always been some puppets acting of their own volition supports this line from the fairy tale of the three brothers of the workshop tower artifact, which describes the origin of the workshop and says that amongst the founding members, there was a stalker who rectified puppets gone wrong. So some stalker affiliated with the workshop was already in charge of containing or possibly decommissioning puppets prior to the puppet frenzy. And if a stalker was in charge of this task, then we can assume that the puppets were too dangerous for an average individual to handle. We also have information that tells us that some puppets were seen in a high regard, as described in the Nameless Ones amulet. There was a time when even puppets were treated as heroes in Krat. This amulet is the vestige of a fireman puppet who was called a hero. So there weren't strictly service puppets like maids and butlers like we see in the game, right? 
There were puppets that performed what were considered heroic and therefore probably dangerous jobs. Now, it's important to keep all of this in mind when we read a very telling piece of information from the description of the Hunter's Amulet. The value of ergo gave rise to a new crime where puppets were used to steal other puppets ergo. Sadly, these thieves met their end by the Hunter puppets that they themselves created. So the first time I read this, I got really excited because basically what this seems like it's saying is that people were using their own puppets to go out and steal other puppets ergo. And in response, there were puppets that were designed specifically for fighting, hunting, and killing other puppets, hunter puppets, as they're described in the amulet. The reason that I'm pointing this out is that most of the puppets we see in the game were created for different purposes other than violence, but this seems to suggest that at some point there were puppets whose sole function was for combat. Now the last thing I want to talk about is Ergo and Stargazers, and we know that Ergo was being used widely across Krat for more than just puppets. It was powering other technology and bringing Krat into a new era, right? The world of tomorrow, thanks to Ergo. And as Ergo was being used more frequently, the petrification disease began to spread outside of just the alchemists. And this is because the large presence and concentration of Ergo created dangerous spores that floated throughout the city. Now these spores needed to be contained, so stargazers were created to collect them. Stargazers were survival devices that captured the Ergo spores that caused the petrification disease to create safe areas. Now, based on this, we can also assume that there may have been other areas where the strong presence of Ergo was too risky for any human to traverse safely, so it would make more sense to deploy puppets to install stargazers in those locations. Now at this point you're probably wondering how any of this has anything to do with Gemini. Well, in the words of Gemini himself, just stick with me pal, because we're about to get into the good stuff. Okay, so now that we've established that there were rogue puppets, there were ergo stealing puppets, and probably an increased need to install stargazers in dangerous areas of Krat, we can take all of this and begin to build out our theory about Gemini. Mm. Jack Daniels. <sighs> so as Krat became more dangerous overall in terms of violent puppets and in terms of petrification disease, it was probably becoming too risky for humans to install stargazers and retrieve ergo to use for production. Puppets could be deployed to perform these tasks, but there was always the risk that they could be attacked by other puppets and have their ergo stolen. So, I think that's when the workshop had a novel idea. To create a super puppet of sorts that was capable of defending itself. This puppet would be going into dangerous situations, so it would also need to be able to learn and adapt and ultimately be smarter than a normal puppet. It would need to be able to think and function more like a human than any puppet ever has in the past. It would need to be able to learn, to grow, and to intelligently adapt to any situation that it encountered. So in order to do that, they created a brand new, totally unique ergo system that would mature and evolve as it collected and stored ergo, eventually enabling it to function completely autonomously. Now, this new system was named the Gemini model and inserted into a puppet heart that was then put into a puppet body that was best suited for combat and traversal. Gemini would be able to go nearly anywhere in Krat and fend for itself, fighting puppets, installing stargazers, and retrieving valuable ergo for the workshop. So, in order to ensure that Gemini was capable of surviving on his own, he was partnered with a highly skilled female stalker to train with. He was her apprentice, so to speak. Now, this stalker would eventually become the legendary stalker, but she wasn't legendary just quite yet. Gemini would elevate her to that status. So that probably seems like a lot, and seems like it's almost completely out of left field, but there's a really awesome piece of evidence that inspired me to start thinking along these lines with this theory. So let's explore the notion of the Path of the Cricket combat style. Now we can assume that this was the technique of the legendary stalker, as she was known as neither a bastard nor a sweeper, but walked her own path to build up her many outstanding achievements. But despite this amazing fighting style that she's credited with, she wasn't the one to create it. 
Gemini did after mastering both the Bastard and Sweeper fighting styles thanks to the Technique Amulet. There are innumerable stalker skills and techniques, yet the puppet who equipped the amulet imprinted with every single combat method took them another leap forward. So we could take this to mean that up until this point, Bastard and Sweeper were the only two recognized fighting styles amongst stalkers. Gemini, as a puppet capable of learning and evolution, equipped the Technique Amulet and used all of his newfound knowledge to develop a new, more advanced fighting style that balances techniques from each side, the Cricket Style. So why was it named the Cricket Style? Well, Sophia tells us early in the game that in the folklore of Krat, a Cricket often acts as a guide. Now, based on the amulet's description, you could say that Gemini guided his stalker companion to a status that distinguished herself from her peers. And as stalkers don animal masks as part of their uniform, the legendary stalker may have decided that a cricket was to be her new moniker. After all, a stylized yet sophisticated cricket mask with a feather plume to represent the antenna would certainly appear legendary. Plus, there are a few other notable instances of crickets in the game, like the wax seals in the guide menu, or the dimensional butterflies that look a lot more like crickets than butterflies. Now, I think there's a lot more to this whole cricket thing than the game has told us, so hopefully we'll get more information in future updates or a DLC. And finally, based on our experiences in the game, with comments from the Black Rabbit Brotherhood and the Red Fox, it seems that Carlo learned the cricket style as well, though it's unclear if Gemini trained Carlo or if the legendary stalker ended up taking him in. Now, personally, I think it was Gemini, but I'll have to discuss that theory in another video before I bore you guys to death. So with all of this, if Gemini was this awesome stalker puppet, essentially, that developed a brand new way of fighting, the cricket style, then how did he end up as the cricket puppet inside of a lamp? So to answer that, let's consider this second piece of evidence that when I read this in the game, my gears started turning and trying to put together this, this whole theory, basically. If we look at the description of the Blue Guardianship Amulet, it says, The girl from the Monad family felt the puppet's pain and it made her sad. She made a special amulet to help the dying puppet recover. Now this is obviously referring to Sophia visually and descriptively, and from what we know, both from things that happened in the past and things we witness in the present day of Krat, the most likely candidate for a puppet whose death would make Sophia sad is Gemini. We know from fighting and beating the nameless puppet at the end of the game that a puppet's heart is precious, and if that's destroyed, then there's no saving the entity behind it. And if Gemini was dying, it implies that somehow his sophisticated heart was severely damaged, not just his body, and moving his heart to a new body wouldn't be enough to save him. I believe that Sophia made and used the Blue Guardianship Amulet to save what little of Gemini actually remained. Then she used her own power to manipulate Ergo to transfer Gemini's remaining consciousness into the cricket puppet inside of her lamp, the Monad's lamp. Think about it, if Gemini's heart was severely damaged, then Sophia was likely limited on time and options, so transferring his ergo into this cricket puppet inside of the lamp she was carrying may have been the only way to save him. This action would essentially create a mix of their ergo that would grant them a special connection, an incredibly strong bond that intertwines their life forces. We've seen a lot of evidence of this connection already, and we'll go into detail in a little bit. <sighs> Transferring Gemini's damaged ergo into this new body would undoubtedly create some errors in his system, which would lead to significant memory loss and the Gemini that we meet in the game. Now, as a side note, I did try to come up with a lore reason why Gemini, who developed the cricket style of fighting, would end up inside of a cricket puppet inside of a lamp, but I couldn't think of anything. So for now, we'll just chalk it up to an ironic coincidence and I may change my mind later. Now, while there's no additional text in the game to corroborate this theory that Sophia transferred Gemini into a cricket body, there are a few things that we can analyze to come up with a plausible explanation for why that happened. Why Sophia cared enough about this puppet to save him in the first place. 
We know that the legendary stalker would make appearances at the Rose Estate, i.e. the Monad Charity House, and that Gemini was with her. And since the Charity House trained children to be stalkers, it makes sense that the legendary stalker and Gemini would come by to check on the student's progress, maybe give some training tips themselves, and potentially evaluate the students for graduation. Therefore, we can assume that Sophia, who lived there as a member of the Monad family, would have known and befriended Gemini during this time. And if we're to believe that the legendary stalker ultimately denied Carlo's request for training, then it's very possible that Gemini decided to take him on as an apprentice, which would probably mean he was around pretty often and would have developed a closer relationship with Sophia and Carlo. Okay, so I had originally come up with this entire theory for the final memory on the beach, the, the red one with the legendary stalker mourning someone and theorizing that she could actually be mourning the death of Gemini and not Carlo, but it was mostly conjecture without hard evidence to back it up, so I decided to cut it. Okay, back to theory crafting. I think that at some point Gemini was severely injured and since Sophia can speak to puppets and manipulate ergo she was able to reach him and used her powers to transfer into the cricket puppet in order to save his life and despite being damaged and losing some of his memory his ability to collect and store ergo remained with him as a core function now how gemini was nearly killed in the first place and how sophia was able to save him in time i'm not sure I also had a whole section about this that I have decided to cut. But if that's something you'd like to see in maybe a Gemini part two video, let me know and maybe we can make that happen. All right, let's round out the story of Gemini by looking into a very curious comment that Sophia makes at the beginning of the game and see if we can figure out why she says he is unique. <laughs> Now, to start, I'm pretty certain that Sophia never refers to Gemini as a puppet. She only refers to him by name in the game. But Gemini is unique. He's more than just a guide. As you get more familiar with Gemini, you'll see what I mean. Which is very curious because she tells us that we're a special puppet multiple times throughout the game. So it's curious because that seems to insinuate that she has a clear distinction of us as a puppet and Gemini in her mind. And that leads me to my first point. Gemini is the name of the Ergo model and not the puppet itself. So like I said earlier, I believe that Gemini was developed as a unique system of Ergo that was capable of learning and growing. And you could view this as a consciousness or even as an artificial intelligence. And that was then placed into a puppet heart. Second, Gemini's true self only exists in Ergo form. Gemini communicates exclusively through ergo waves. Think about it. Anytime Gemini speaks to us, we hear a chirp first and then his voice. I'm Gemini, your friendly puppet guide. Or friendly guide puppet? No, I think that's because the cricket puppets in these lamps aren't built with speech capabilities, just the ability to make a cute <laughs> chirping sound. So if the chirp is the only audible sound that he makes, then the conversations he has with us must be telepathic, essentially, through Ergo. This is also why his voice as a puppet is the only one that sounds clear and doesn't share the same distortion effects as every other puppet we meet in the game, because it's not coming out of a speaker. My name is Polandina Pulcinella, at your service, sir. I bid you welcome, puppet of Geppetto. Back in the day, the only way to reach the cathedral was using a rope and pulley! And this telepathic ergo communication is why we are the only character aside from Sophia that speaks to Gemini. The three of us are connected by her ergo, us because of the blue butterfly on the train, and Gemini because she put him into the cricket with her own power. Now as a side note, this special link is also why we are the only characters in the game that talk to and about Sophia. Uh, aside from Manus, who knows the real Sophia. Third, Gemini's ability to store Ergo, as well as his connection to Sophia. Now this is really cool to think about for a few reasons. First, when we defeat an enemy, notice that the Ergo we collect travels into Gemini, not into our body directly. Gemini is storing it for us. That's why we have to use Sophia to convert that Ergo into power when we level up, 
because we don't have the ability to manipulate Ergo ourselves until we become strong enough later in the game. Second, because Gemini can store Ergo and is powered by energy from the blue butterfly, he's able to detect and reveal the dimensional butterflies we encounter throughout Krat. Remember, he asks why the Ergo is reacting like that, so it's not an ability of Gemini's innately. Third, when we die, we lose the Ergo that we've collected and stored within Gemini. When we return to get it, we see it swirling with blue butterflies. Again, because Gemini's Ergo is mixed with Sophia's. And finally, this last one is one of my favorite details in the entire game. Let's read the item descriptions for Gemini's Iron Protection and Gemini's Emergency Protection. Food for the Cricket Puppet that receives help from Gemini. The Gemini model was built so it could be fed Ergo to build Affinity. However, no one could have imagined that this model had another ability that was even more special. So this description has several huge implications, okay? First, it all but confirms that Gemini isn't just the Cricket Puppet. He is the consciousness within the puppet, right? The puppet that receives help from Gemini. Secondly, it refers to him as a model that could be fed Ergo to build affinity. This would be crucial as a wholly autonomous puppet that could feed on Ergo and learn and grow and become more human on its own. Third, the notion of building affinity, meaning building a relationship, could explain why Gemini refers to us as Bud and Pal throughout the game, right? He truly feels an advanced kinship with us, and in turn, we're meant to feel a strong bond with him as well. As for another ability that is even more special, I'm not sure what that's referring to exactly. Maybe it's something that I just described or maybe it's something different entirely. I have no idea, but if you guys have any suggestions or ideas what that might be, let me know in a comment. I'd appreciate it. And finally, let's go back to the very beginning of the game when we first meet Gemini, right? He's broken, his voice is distorted, and he has no personality whatsoever. He also very curiously mentions that he will restart soon, just like a system would. He's running low on power, emergency power even, and it isn't until we reach the hotel and directly interact with Sophia's projection that he fully restarts and fixes himself because he's received a surge of power from the blue butterfly for a full reboot. Johnny is fine. 12 seconds later. Don't be alarmed. My name is Gemini. So if we're going with my theory about Gemini, then there is still the mystery of how he was nearly killed in the first place and transferred into the lamp. But other than that, the last real mystery is how Gemini ended up in the train car at the beginning of the game and why he was damaged or maybe apparently with someone else who was damaged or injured. There are so many possibilities and of course I have some ideas, but I haven't found any information or clues within the game to support those. So right now, again, it's all conjecture. But as with any video game with a great story, we can only hope to get some more information or answers in future updates or maybe even the DLC. In the meantime, let me know if you guys have any theories about Gemini and all of the stuff that we talked about. And just to be clear, I'm not stating any of this information as fact, right? These are just my opinions. These are my theories based on the information in the game and it could be interpreted way differently by somebody else. So take it all with a grain of salt. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Like the video and subscribe if you had a good time. Uh, I've got ideas for more Liza P videos. I don't plan on this being my only one, but if you have suggestions for future content, please let me know. Thanks for sticking around with me. I appreciate you, and hopefully I'll see you soon. All right, McDuck out. Peace.